so I know I've been talking a bunch between panels, so I won't, I won't do too much of an intro, but um, this is a conversation about on-chain art and you know, not just some of the specific forms that we've recently seen, such as generative art, AI art, you know, we're really going to be covering a broad range of different areas in which the space is really adopting on-chain technologies, and I have an incredible group of experts who are building in the space, which I am consistently inspired by every day, so I'm really happy that we can all be together to have this conversation. So let's just start um, by everyone going down the line and introducing themselves, you know, who you are, what you do, and if you can tell the audience your favorite one of one or NFT art collection. Um, sure. Um, oh, and it's on. Uh, hi, I'm Susanna Maybank. I am the CEO and co-founder of Tonic.xyz, a new gallery offering curated digitally native art that bridges the digital and physical divide. Um, we are looking to expand the uh, the collector base and introduce generative and digitally native work to a much wider audience. Um, I come from the traditional art world. I have been um, constantly inspired by art for my entire life. It's been my driving force. And when I discovered the artists creating in um, generative first, but it, in the digitally native space, I was quickly convinced that it was the most fruitful and interesting and exciting new frontier in um, art and creation broadly. So it was a really easy yes. I've dived in and loved every second of it. As for my favorite collection, um, this is a bit of a cliche because it was released on Tonic, but Strands of Solitude by William Upon is so good. <laughs> um, and to be able to watch it evolve over the months that we were working with him has been a true honor. Um, I would suggest looking at it and looking at the, the details and the traits are actually incredibly inspiring. They're so completely fluidly integrated into the concept behind the work and it's just um, a really incredible series. Thank you. Hi, I'm Straith. I'm the uh, executive creative director for Palm NFT Studio. Susanna, I'm incredibly inspired by what you've built at Tonic and this idea of moving us towards uh, an experience of art that feels really expansive. So at Palm, our focus is uh, really on building deep fan communities on chain. And we do that in partnership with some of the world's leading artists that include voices like Damien Hirst. That also includes studios like Warner Brothers and publishers like DC and labels like UMG. I think that th for, for a through line, there's there's a hope in what we make with these creators that we can usher in an age of Web3 that feels inherently more connective than speculative. And I think on-chain art helps move us in that direction for sure. Love it. Uh, hi, I'm Douglas. I'm the founder and CEO of Wild. Uh, at Wild, uh, we're building the best way to collect, create, and explore experiential art. Uh, we believe that the future of the internet is a spatial future, and we think experiential art will be at the center of that. Um, uh, our, our main focus right now is building our digital artist residency, uh, and the, uh, so by the end of the year, we'll have over 100 artists that have gone through that, which is pretty cool. And uh, my prior uh, experience is uh, building marketplaces. I was the founder and CEO of a company called Apartment List for about 14 years, and uh, my favorite piece is, um, that is a very hard question, but I have to go with uh, this amazing person, Mitchell F. Chan, total genius. Uh, he was one of the first uh, folks to ever put art on the blockchain um, with his digital zones in 2017. Uh, so if you haven't checked out Mitchell, he is uh, super legendary. Awesome, awesome. Wait, Straith, you didn't mention your favorite if you wanted to. I uh, yeah, I, I sort of dodged that tough question. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> thank you for, it's thank a you hard for making question, me choose. I, know. I, I do think one of the things that really moved me in a profound way was one of the first projects that we worked on at Palm with Damien Hurst. The Currency Project, I think, as a, participa a participatory artwork, is really profound. You have the ability to decide, do you burn the NFT and keep the painting? Do you burn the painting and keep the NFT? I think seeing through that project, the power of digital ownership and seeing people choose the NFT over the physical painting um, unlocked something for me. But also, it served as a really powerful reminder that we have agency over the value systems that we want to employ. We have agency over the trajectory of tech. And to hold on to that and to not forget that 
felt uh, for me like something to to hold on to about that work and to hold on to as sacred as we move through the space. Totally, and that's such an important tenet in Web3 as we're building all of these different types of projects, marketplaces, residencies, you name it. Um, that being said, NFT markets faced a very chilling 2022, but digital art seemed to defy some of these trends with skyrocketing sales, increased adoption, and recently more presence in person in galleries, museums, etc. So what are some of the reasons behind this? And you know, as we see digitally native art rising, you know, why this genre opposed to other types of NFTs? Yeah, I'm happy to jump in there. Yeah, I, uh, uh, I, I look at this starting with the artist side. You know, artists have the opportunity now to completely kind of transform their connection with their audience, their fans, to build emotional connection at a scale that they never could before um, going art gallery to art gallery and show to show. And so now like the, um, you know, the, the artists that we, we see continued kind of uh, amazing uh, artists flock into this space and exploring the blockchain, learning about it. And, and so we feel like the residency is like where we get to see all this firsthand, but I think creating that financial independence too and focusing more on like finding 100 people to love you, eventually 1,000 people to love you, is something that um, artists can tap into, whether it's a bull market or a bear market. So we see like uh, just a flood of amazing talent that continues to come to this space. Yeah, I, I think that the rise of generative art, the the sort of the foregrounding of that and the way that that's captured the discourse, like I, I think that that is so, it makes sense because seeing yourself in an artwork for the first time or seeing being able to own something that's unique to you that reflects one of a million or hundreds of thousands of permutations, like it clicks for you because again, like you have in that artwork something um, something that you can identify with, something that is fully unique. And personalization as a driver, I, I think, is really powerful. So that, that to me, feels like uh, an incredible driver behind the rise of generative art. I think also, as we're seeing the explosion of AI and text to image, we'll inherently see more voices enter the space because the bar of entry, access to creating with code, is much, I mean, it's much more accessible than it ever has been. And, with more voices entering the space, I think we can only we can only begin to see it grow and morph and begin to reflect the the voice and intent of these new creators who are embracing these tools too. Awesome. And Susanna, I know if you had a response. I was truly going to say basically these two points. The quality of the artists and the authenticity of of generative art and digitally native art. It um, it's the first medium that I have found that was had a real use case for being on the blockchain and was completely internally authentic. I also think that we live in an age completely mediated by our relationships with computers, and so it makes so much sense that people are finding this emotional connection in these works that have this very, very intense relationship for the artist and their machine. Absolutely, and I think talking about use case is super important in this situation, you know? A lot of people question the utility of NFTs, and sometimes digital art comes into that conversation where people ask, you know, why would you put this on your wall? Like, would you put it on your wall? You know, but it's talking about other collections, or you know, not to name anything, but I guess you know, other types of NFTs that might not come across as something that should be, you know, appreciated in the same way as art. So, I guess you know, I'll direct the question back at you. Do we need to question its use case? Really? Do we have to define it? Um, I find this such an interesting, you see how cyclical history is, the idea that we're now questioning is this useful. One legal definition in the US of art is that it's not useful, it has no utility. Um, and so the idea that someone should dictate exactly how you can enjoy and build a relationship with a piece of art um, is something that we've seen before, but it just gets picked up again. And same with the the premium placed on materiality. If you go to the Middle Ages, no one thought that canvases would ever take off because it was cheap material. They did things out of gold and jewels, and they said, this is ridiculous. The Mona Lisa was made the century that this conversation was happening, and that is likely one of the most valuable paintings in the entire world. So we've seen this before, we'll see it again. I personally, um, at Tonic, we do prioritize making sure that you have the option for a physical derivative of every single work that we sell, because I, I personally need to live with art, I need to have it in my space, and I can't afford that many screens. Um, but, 
but I think it's a personal preference. I think it's giving that um, autonomy back to the collector and saying, you can decide what to do with this. This is an image that you own. The copyright being more um, explicit in those contracts, all of that is really just opening up the, the options for how you can enjoy. Awesome. And Douglas, I'm also curious for your response to this question, you know, building the wild verse and really trying to make these immersive experiences. You know, I guess is, do we need to be seeking a definition to utility there, or what's your relationship with it when it comes to onboarding artists? Yeah, I welcome that conversation around utility. I encourage artists to embrace that too, because like uh, the, the simplest utility that it, um, any artist can provide is just access to themselves. And like some of the um, strongest relationships I have in Web3 uh, culminated from just an artist being like available to say what's up to me. And, um, and, I, and I love that. And that is something that's super authentic to a lot of artists uh, that want to connect with their fans and, and the folks that collect their work. Uh, so when I think about the future of utility though, you know, I think all of us in this room, if we're collecting digital art, have probably a lot of 2D NFTs that collect a lot of dust in virtual wallets, virtual dust in virtual wallets. And you know, I, um, I am really excited about a future state where you can really experience the art. You can step inside of it. You can be fully immersed within it. And I'm really excited to put a bunch of um, super talented artists in the same room where they can, um, they can learn and create that, that spatial internet together. And so um, I actually don't shy away from utility. I, I kind of view it as a challenge. And I think it's a good bar for the artist because if you're not providing some utility in some shape or form that the collectors value. It's very possible that the artist next door is. And, um, and so w why get left behind? That's kind of part of the space. We want to create an inclusive environment where the water's warm, come on in. Totally. Um, so I want to switch gears a little bit to talking about everyone's favorite new shiny toy, AI, which is exciting, also very terrifying, if I'm being honest. Um, so while generative art has been on the rise, so has AI. And, you know, it's something that definitely differs from generative art in the sense that, you know, it takes a degree of autonomy to, you know, execute this creative process, but AI sort of does it all on its own. So what does AI mean for not just the future of generative art, but the future of on-chain art? And Straith, I'll um, direct this question to you first. Sure, I, I think while this is a fraught topic, for me, there's a lot to be optimistic about within. I think that the adoption, the explosion, the sort of mainstreaming of AI tools as we've seen over the course of the, the past couple of months have really introduced so many people to the power, the promise, the potential, the mechanics of what it means to collaborate with code. And so, again, as we improve access to these types of tools, I think we can begin to welcome new creators into this space and new types of artists who potentially before didn't necessarily see a future or pathway forward for themselves as artists, again, who can begin to create and collaborate with code for the first time. I think it is in so many ways reductive to think about like technology and, and sort of like a technological reduce, revolution is something that happens in a vacuum. Like it's gonna be about the people that use the tools and if this improves access to people to create with these tools, I think it's a really good thing. I think one of the things that we've thought about quite a bit at Palm is how do we improve access to the tools that we use to make generative collections. And so looking at being able to, to open source our own 3D art engines and to make that something that's publicly available to, again, improve access to what we all think will be the medium of the future, I think will help change and direct that medium in really exciting ways. Awesome. Um, Douglas or Susanna, if you want to add anything. Um, I think I, I have a very similar opinion to Straith. I think um, the more people that enter the space, I am not um, militant about how they enter or how they find interest. I think that in terms of the risk, I think that the only small caveat is that the language gets confusing for people. I've done panels before where people say, well, these models are trained, uh, speaking specifically about a generative artist, these models are trained on other people's works. This is, this is stealing, this is copyright infringement. And it was because of that, the very similar sounding generative AI <laughs> and generative art. And so I think it's about education and being really, really forward in explaining to people um, 
the process and how these works came to be. I don't think that there's anything less valuable inherently about AI artwork. I just think that we need to, that part of the magic in these digitally native artworks is how they came to be. It's, um, it's part of what I really love about it. It's being able to look into the code of the generative piece and understand how this came to be. So I think it's education, but I think in general, it's a really positive thing. Everyone cares about it. Everyone's looking at it. Let's use it as a way to, um, you know, rise the star across the board. Yeah, and, and I think we're still in the point first, like point zero 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 one percent of how a AI is going to transform the space. So um, it's coming. It's inevitable. And and as a creator in the space, like my recommendation would be to embrace it and figure out how it can be a part of your practice. So it doesn't mean robots are better than artists, um, but it does mean that uh, it's going to be part of a lot of practices. I asked kind of like a provocative question on Twitter um, last month around like. You know, will a Grammy be won by a completely like AI song in the next five years? And I like thought about it, and my answer is, like, I think it might happen like in the next year. <laughs> like, I guarantee, like if you can use the power of you know GPT-4 to figure out like what the next, like what the right lyrics or the right beat is on something you've been working on, um, like people are going to tap into the power of that, um, and it'll be pretty uh, like a priceless um, opportunity for an artist. Totally. Like I said at the beginning, it's amazing how quickly it's moved. It's also terrifying. I mean, just since, I guess, the end of 2022, you know, we've had chat GPT. It's only getting smarter. Um, but so we'll see what happens. But AI aside, as we deem on-chain art capable of achieving mass adoption or greater recognition in the traditional art world, we've yet to see the infrastructure that makes onboarding truly easy for the average consumer, average art collector, someone who's not a Web3 native, you know, traditional user. So what are some of the challenges that collectors face at the moment, you know, also challenges that you might face in building these platforms, and what needs to be done to help make the buying process more efficient? Yeah, um, you know, I look at this, like a lot of the, our companies are still in the early uh, stages of their maturity and still proving concepts and finding product market fit. Um, so I don't view it as our responsibility necessarily to solve onboarding. Um, but the panel is titled "How to Get to 100 Million Users," not like 8 million users. Uh, and so, um, if we're trying to get to 100 million, I think that uh, it's very uh, possible that um, the best routes are things like what Reddit did. You know, Reddit onboarded almost like seven people in you know, seven million people in NFTs. Um, and you know it happens kind of behind the scenes, and I and I think that that's okay if it happens behind the scenes. I think people onboarding to crypto, not like totally realizing that, is not the worst thing in the world um, because um, we've started this space um, in a very adversarial way with like the incumbent ways to purchase things and to transact, and I think that building um, building kind of a mechanism to to onboard lots of people without having to. Uh, to like get them to download MetaMask <laughs> uh, is a very valuable tool, but I also don't view it as like necessarily our jobs to invent that. And I think there's so many smart people building those on onboarding um, frameworks for companies like ours to use in the future. So when they're here, we're really excited to tap into that. We um, since really our reason to be is to is to introduce the stories and art of of digitally native artists to a wider audience, it was sort of mission critical for us to find a way to lower some of these barriers. And the really obvious ones, you know, low hanging fruit was we needed to figure out a way to have people not have to pay with ETH, to be able to transact with credit cards or wire, and then not require a MetaMask or a hot wallet when they arrive. Um, and we did that through um, pretty much just bearing it one layer down. And so if you show up, you can transact with credit card. That payment is then immediately transferred into ETH and used to um, transact the purchase. But we wanted to make sure that anyone who shows up the date of, of an auction, regardless of how they got there, um, can still transact. That said, even with those barriers taken down, it's still a huge educational lift. And there's still a lot, with the panel before this was on security, there's still a lot of education around security and understanding exactly what they got. And so I think it's, um, there's some things that make it much easier, but I don't think the job is done. I think there's yeah, still a huge way to go there. Yeah, I, I think that Douglas and Susanna have really neatly articulated sort of the the onboarding approach and 
and sort of the, the changes that need to happen from an experience perspective. For me, there are a couple other levers that come to mind too. I, I think that, again, generative art has popped off and had this moment because it's a system that allows for a greater degree of personalization. And seeing yourself in an artwork is onboarding. I think uh, participatory frameworks like governance, we have uh, a project with DC that allows uh, holders to to vote on and to shape comic books with us and to create canon. And so, again, being able to participate in a project in a really visceral way is also onboarding. I think one thing that our one of our colleagues says frequently and I think is a good challenge and opportunity is that, you know, the, the shortest the shortest distance between an idea and a community is a story. And so to be able to create context for people and, and not just content feels like another really powerful and also accessible leveler for, for onboarding uh, new friends into the space. Awesome, awesome. So we only have two minutes left, but I'm gonna ask a really loaded question and we're gonna give really short answers. So apologies, I wish we had more time to talk about it. But two years down the line, whatever crypto markets might do, where do you see digital art adoption standing and what are your predictions? I'll open that up to everyone. I think you're going to see it in much wider adoption in museums and in gallery spaces, sort of the traditional art market. In terms of numbers, I can't give you an exact, but I do think that at some point there'll be exponential growth. There'll be a tipping point, and then enough of your friends will be in it that will experience that sort of rocket ship exponential growth. And I do think that that time is, I don't see any reason why it wouldn't be in the next two years. I, I think that generative design systems will transcend the art world. I think that will happen rapidly. I think that marketers, brand designers, almost anybody that needs to create content for digital environments will need to use generative systems, will need to use generative tools because the way in which we create will, will need to be exponential, but it will also need to be personal. So I think thinking about the mainstreaming of generative design feels like something that will touch all of us over the course of the next months and the next year. Uh, I think you know all great marketplaces really start with the supply side. This is a two-sided marketplace. There are like creators and artists that create amazing digital art, and there are collectors and people that experience that, uh, that, um, that engage in that community, and this is no different. Uh, so when I think about the next two years, I think we're gonna see an order of magnitude more than, greater than 10x onboarding, not of demand, necessarily, but of supply. And in this case, that's artists. Like, why would you not, if you were a Web3 creator and you're, all your friends were doing this and having like uh, maybe mixed experiences because of a bear market, but so much promise and so much opportunity to be a full-time artist, like to explore that, I think is a very low, um, low hurdle for a lot of artists. And so, and then as a result of that, you get this flywheel effect because each of those artists has a collector base or fans that may or may not be engaged in Web3. And if they're in Web2, they're like, hey, my next thing is this virtual, um, you know, this immersive experience I'm dropping. Um, you know, we get really excited to kind of like tell those stories. And so I look at it as in terms of like how many artists will be in the space in two years. And I think that is a massive number and I think that's gonna bode well for the entire space. Awesome. I always learn so much from you guys. It's always so fun to have these conversations. So thank you so much and enjoy the rest of your NFT NYC. Thanks, Cam. Thank you thank so you. much. Thank you all. Thank you all.